we're going to wait just another minute and then we will get started with today's presentation. In the meantime, um, if anyone is unable to hear, um, just, just let us know in the chat box. And please continue to let us know that you are able to hear. Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, as, as I said, welcome to the TCAP Graduate Student Seminar Series again. And we have with us today um, Araby Belcher, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing names, um, who is a graduate student at Oregon State University, um, and Celeste Falcon, who is a graduate student at the University of Minnesota, and Alfonso Cuesta Marcos. Um, who is an assistant research professor at Oregon State University, and they all work on barley. And today they are going to share with us um, a presentation on type 2 modified, modified um, Okay, um, just uh, this is Airby. I'm going to start things off. So just to let everyone know, you can see uh, Alfonso has a little microphone icon by his name. We're sharing a, uh, a headset. So, um, right. Okay, um, and a quick question for everybody who has had a chance to look at the original PowerPoint slideshow that was posted online for the type 2 modifier mentioned design. Okay, cool. Yeah, so um, a lot of this, a lot of this presentation is going to be uh, the slides, the slides from that. So, um, so I'll, but since a lot of people haven't seen it, then I'll go through it a little more, uh, a little more carefully then. Uh, all right, so Alfonso, myself, and Celeste are all going to speak. There's going to be five parts to this presentation. First, we're, I'm just going to talk about unreplicated designs in general, and then go into the basics of type 2 modified augmented design analysis specifically. Then Alfonso is going to talk about how to analyze data and create trials for type 2 modified augmented designs using the AgriBase software system. And then Celeste is going to go through analysis that she did of her own data from a type 2 modified augmented design uh, that she analyzed with SAS and R. And then we're going to finish up with a description of how to get heritabilities for just for like association mapping stuff. And um, okay. So, a type 2 modified augmented design is a type of unreplicated design. And the first thing that you have to decide when you're deciding whether or not you want to use a type 2 modified augmented design is if you want to use a, an unreplicated design at all. And I've actually, most of the feedback that I've gotten so far about, um, about the type 2 modified augmented design that I've put up previously is just, uh, you know, do, are, are, are unreplicated designs worth it? So why would you ever want to do an unreplicated design? Well, of course, uh, replications are always better. Uh, you're going to improve your accuracy, and you're going to improve your precision. But you can't always afford to do a replicated design. 
for a variety of reasons. And especially uh, in breeding, in earlier generations, you don't actually have the seed. Or, or a lot of times with these mapping panels, you don't have the seed for a number of replications, or for a lot of replications. And sometimes you only have enough seed for one replication. So if you know that you're always going to reduce your accuracy and reduce your precision, is it still OK? For, is, it, is it safe enough to do an unreplicated design? Uh, well, so if you're doing an unreplicated design, you augment the design with checks. And the checks are going to be able to estimate your experimental error. And they're also going to be able to account for some of the variability due to field effects. Still, you're, you're still going to have experimental error, and you need to kind of decide how much that's going to cause problems for you, which is going to depend on uh, the type of error in your field and what kind of questions your experiment is trying to answer. And there is a terrible pun. Um, so, Again, um, is, is, is an unreplicated design going to be safe for your experiment, or is it going to cause you a lot of problems? Well, so you have the checks you account for field effects, but checks are never going to be able to completely account for, for the field effects. So you're still going to have variation due to that. Uh, the power is usually a lot lower because power is based. Um, so even though you can get, a, by increasing your um, by increasing the number of checks that you have, you're still not going to have as much power as if you would replace, or as if you would um, uh, replicate your actual entries. And then for means estimates of your entries, with the variation due to just pure experimental error, not due to field effects, only replications can account for that. And actually, this this says. This imprecision should actually be uh, in accuracy. But, um, and uh, so since you know you're going to have those problems, then you have to ask yourself, what type of experiments are, are those problems not going to, uh, to be an issue for you? So what types of experiments do you, where you're going to what types of experiments are you going to run where you're going to have field effects that you can't account for by checks? Do you always need uh, a fair amount of power? And um, is your, how, how large is your experimental error? How, how much is your experimental error going to throw off your estimates of the entry means? And then also, how badly do you need to avoid replicating? So. Uh, a lot of times, so, so there's two types of trials specifically in plant breeding where you're going to, uh, to, to need to or at least be tempted to use unreplicated designs. And that's earlier generation trials. So when you're doing, say, preliminary yield trials or trials like F4s, F5s, um, you don't have much seed and you have a lot of lines, you want to you, you don't necessarily want to do or plant replications. And then also uh, QTL mapping or uh, association studies uh, and part of uh, part of the, the the reduction in issues that you have with the designs for those projects is that you don't replicate the lines, but the alleles are replicated. So you sort of skirt the replication issue to some degree there. And then uh, for both of those types of trials, you, you're not so much interested in the power, because unreplicated designs, you're going to reduce your power. But in early generation trials, you're not, in, in QTL mapping studies, you're not really trying to make comparisons and, 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 uh, and get uh, have have power to detect small differences between two individual lines so much as you kind of want, uh, especially for 
for the earlier generation trials, you, you just really want an, an approximate rank. You just want to be able to, you're trying to select the top whatever percent, and you just want the, you know, th that to be, that selection to be fairly accurate as to which lines are the best. And then uh, uh, with both types of trials, it's really more the approximate relative value that you want. And especially with earlier generation trials, um, you're, you know, eventually you are going to want better estimates of those lines, but you're going to get better estimates in later generations. So, so, so given that, like, even if you do have one of those two types of trials, maybe you, maybe, maybe you, you still can't afford to have an unreplicated design. So when you look at uh, the measurement of a given plot, it's going to be uh, it's going to be based on first your mean, and then the uh, the effect due to your entry, and some field effects which would be accounted for by your checks. But then also because the checks can't account for er for all field effects, you're going to have some kind of field effects. To, uh, that you can't account for with your checks, and then just pure, pure mental error. And really, these two uh, are going to be pooled into one estimate, but the reason I divide them up for this model is that, in theory, you might be able to account for, uh, for this variation by some other method, maybe some, uh, some kind of spatial analysis. So this this is this is just sort of left there out of hope, I guess. Uh, but um, anyway, so uh, but so those two these two errors are going to be what uh, what makes or breaks the usefulness of your unreplicated design. And if they're too big, then an unreplicated design is not for you. So, you know, I've been talking with a lot of people about, you know, just sort of worries about, you know, theoretically, what kind of problems could you have? And so I thought I'd put up some of my actual data and to kind of get, uh, I, I thought a good way to look at it was to go since one of the things that you're really interested in is, is, is rank. Uh, for a given line uh, in a given position, and so for position I just put uh, percentile, basically how likely is it, or how, how far is it going to kind of move around in rank due to your experimental error? Which again, you can only account for, with experimental error, you're, you're only going to be able to improve the accuracy of the estimate of your mean by greater replications. And so basically the idea is that, you know, if you're doing an earlier generation yield trial, how likely are you to take, um, if, if the true mean of, of, your, of your top line is here, how likely are you due to exper experimental error with only one replication going to actually estimate it uh, further away? And I just p picked intervals of, of 10 percentiles. And so just to kind of quick go through this, um, and this is this is looking at it with an experiment with uh, with a field that happened to have pretty low field variation and also a trait uh, heading date that's generally considered, and it was certainly true here, very low coefficient variation uh, to have to uh, to have pretty low experimental error. And so uh, we, if if people are interested, I can. Go, go back to these later, but to kind of go over them now. Um, so if you can't control, if you, the, uh, the stuff in the middle, which um, these lines are going to be about, uh, about normally distributed, so the stuff, there's going to be a lot more lines that are sort of closer together in the middle. Um, and so there's kind of more opportunity for them to, to change in rank. Uh, 
And uh, if you can't control for those extra field effects, then you're, if, if you have a line that where the true mean would be in the 60th percentile of your lines, for you to actually measure it at the 50th percentile, if you can't control for your for that extra field error and you only have one rep, you have a reasonably high probability of, of it uh, actually being measured at, at, at 10 percentiles lower. And then with two reps, you improve it a little bit, but not too much. And I just put two reps because if you can, if, if you actually have the option of doing three or four reps, then, then you should probably just do three or four reps. Uh, unreplicated designs are, are more for, since replications are always better, uh, unreplicated designs are more for when you just can't replicate. Um, and but anyway, but if you are able to control for that extra field variation, then your probability of uh, of uh, of getting an inaccurate, uh, a, a pretty grossly inaccurate assessment of your of your line goes down a lot. And then with uh, with these kind of trials, though, you're not so much interested in the rank of the things in the middle because you know, for an earlier generation trial, you're not selecting in the middle, or, or probably not, I hope not. Um, but, uh, uh, but you're selecting on the ends, and then uh, with mapping studies, usually you get more information from the stuff on the ends. And so, and that kind of moves around a lot less. So the probability of your, with, uh, with just one rep, uh, for your for your hundredth percentile line to actually be measured at the level of your ninetieth percentile line, um, with just one rep and not being able to control experimental error, you actually have a pretty low probability of measuring it uh, a lot lower than you want it to be. Anyway, um, and then just to give you a general idea, if you have a much higher so this is, a, this is for yield, which has much higher experimental error, and this happened to be from a field that had a lot higher field variation. Um, your probabilities of, of your lines kind of moving around in rank uh, get much higher. But also, again, uh, it doesn't help too much to add that second, to add that second rep. And so, but anyway, the, the main point of this is that this is basically the questions you want to ask yourself. How, uh, how bad is my experimental error, first off? And secondly, how much do I care about how bad my experimental error is? What, what kind of questions am I trying to answer? Is it OK if, uh, you know, if, the, if, if you're incorrectly measuring a lot of stuff in the middle, but getting pretty pretty good measurements of the, of the rank of the things on the ends. And a lot of times uh, for, for mapping trials and for earlier generation yield trials, or sorry, earlier generation trials, it, you don't really need that high of precision, that high of accuracy. So, um, and there's also, there's also a lot of literature on this, and uh, I have a lot <laughs> of literature that I've been reading, and if anyone is interested, I can send you stuff if you email me. Uh, then moving on to type two modified augmented designs. If you've if you've decided, or if if you're like me, if you started your graduate project and it's and and your uh, or when you start your graduate program, your experiments are already planted in the fields, and the design or the decision has been made for you. Um, but you you want to do an um, replicated design and then you choose a type 2 modified augmented design, well, you have all this data, how do you analyze it? And just FYI for those of you who've seen the, uh, the slides online that I posted about a month or so ago, these are mostly those same slides. So, uh, anyway, so with the modified augmented design, uh, just like any augmented design, you make a number of replications of, or a high number of replications of checks. 
and those are going to be controlling for your field variation. And so just imagine that uh, the, um, all the, so all the squares, this grid here represents a field, all the white squares represent incomplete blocks. And you can kind of imagine all the white space in between filled with uh, the plots of your various entries, your experimental entries. And then the yellow squares are your primary checks. And what distinguishes a type 2 modified augmented design or a type 1 modified augmented design um, is that your, you have a primary check that is replicated in every incomplete block and the, its plot is in the dead center of each incomplete block. And then once you've decided your primary check, then you can select two or more secondary checks. Your secondary checks are not replicated in every incomplete block. You pick a number of uh, whatever, uh, however many incomplete blocks you think are, are, are ideal for you to have secondary checks in, you, uh, so for me, I, I selected four incomplete blocks to have secondary checks. You put all of your secondary checks, here I just have two, in four randomly assigned incomplete blocks. And then you just fill the rest of the field up with entries or fillers. And so here's an example of an experiment I have. Uh, you can see all of the primary checks in yellow across the incomplete blocks, and then the secondary checks in red and blue scattered throughout. And Here's the, here's an incomplete block of 15 with a primary check in the middle and two secondary check blocks. Right, so I think, Alfonso, you like to do row column restrictions, although, so I believe, I could be wrong, but I believe in the original papers that they initially randomly assigned, they, ran, they randomly assigned uh, the, the incomplete blocks, and then, so there's, and that might be, Yeah, no, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure in the initial literature that they did randomly assign the incomplete blocks and randomly assign the plots within the incomplete blocks. Um, that might have changed. Uh, so, but we actually, I'm going to take uh, more in depth questions and save those till the end. There's kind of a lot of stuff to get through, but that's, that's something we could most certainly discuss later. Um, so, all right, sorry. Okay, so um, so anyway, once you've created your field design and you have your data, um, you need to analyze your data and you need to make adjustments for field effects. So, uh, there's two types of ways to make adjustments for field effects. And the first is conveniently called method one. And when you use method one to make adjustments, you just ignore the secondary checks. And you purely make adjustments to field effects on the primary checks. And what you do, and you, and you make those adjustments based on row column effects alone. And so then what you do is you can just run an ANOVA to, uh, to estimate row column effects and look at uh, the F tests 
And the ANOVA is just, you just analyze the ANOVA as though the, um, uh, the primary checks were the only plots in the field, essentially. And, uh, and here, in this case, there were no significant row column effects. And, uh, and then you can also use the uh, mean square error that you get from that to, to get your standard error for uh, upload to T3. And then once you determine your row column effects, then you simply adjust all your lines by taking the measurement of an actual line and subtracting uh, the first the row effect, which is just the difference in the average for the primary check in that row versus the overall average for the primary check. And then you subtract the column effect, which is simply the difference between the average for the primary check in that column uh, versus the overall average for the primary check. And then you get a number. So the second method is inconveniently called method three. And with method three, you're actually going to use all of the check data. Well, you're, I'm sorry, you're going to use all three checks, but you're only going to use the data from within the incomplete blocks that, or to decide how to make your adjustments, you're only going to use the data from the incomplete blocks that actually had secondary checks. So you can see that there's um, uh, your, with, with method one, you're trading number of checks used for making adjustments to basing the, to, to basing the, the adjustments on more incomplete blocks versus with method three, you're using three different types of checks to make adjustments, but you're restricting the space from which you've estimated, the number of incomplete blocks from which you've estimated those adjustments. And to decide the adjustments for method three, you regress the average of the two secondary checks within each of the incomplete blocks in which there were secondary checks. You, um, you regress that against the primary, the value of the primary check in each of those incomplete blocks. And you take the slope of that regression and use that to make your adjustments. And so then what you'll do is you'll take, uh, to get the adjusted value for each line, you'll take the, uh, the raw data for that line, or the raw datum for that line, and you will find the difference between the primary check in that because this is, right, so this is uh, on average, so this regression here is on average how much your, uh, your checks are changing based on how much your, or your secondary checks are changing based on how much your primary checks are changing. So you figure out how much your primary check changed in that incomplete block based on, or versus uh, the average for that primary check. And then you multiply that times the slope and subtract that as your field effect from the raw value to get your adjusted line value. And so then here there's just two secondary checks, but however many secondary checks you have, you just take the average for all of them. Now, potentially you don't missing data, and we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, oh, right here, we're talking about it. Okay, so um, so basically, there's no hard and fast rules, as far as I know, for how, uh, how you deal with missing data. You can, you, you just decide what you think is best based on, um, based on what's going on with your data set. Uh, some software will actually just exclude that incomplete block from the analysis if there's any missing checks. 
But you know, if you have four missing check or, or four secondary checks, and you know, you have a much greater chance of at least one of them being missing in any given plot. And so you might end up, in, and you might not want to throw away a whole incomplete block just because one of your four uh, secondary checks is missing. But you you basically just make that decision <laughs> on your own. And then to decide between making the method one adjustment or the method three adjustment, you, uh, for a given uh, set of data for a single trait from a single experiment, you're going to make the same, uh, use the same method to adjust all of your lines. Well, you don't, you don't have to, but generally you are. And uh, to compare the two methods and their effectiveness, you're going to look at relative efficiency. And so uh, relative efficiency is just comparing how much you've reduced your experimental error. And so you're going to look at the, um, uh, you're defining your experimental error as the error within an incomplete block. And uh, you're going to look at the, the improvements from adjusting by taking the, um, the, uh, all right, seeing uh, how much you or how much greater your uh, your error was before adjustment compared to your error after the adjustment. So then, of course, a higher relative efficiency is better. You do that for both methods. Uh, and when you calculate incomplete or the the error between plots within blocks, you just use your secondary check data because it's it's actually the only way that you can do it. All right, so I'm not going to go into detail here. There's uh, there's um, a, so this is all, well, the adjustments that were, that I showed before are all based on a dummy data set that I made, which is a subset of some actual experimental data that I had. And uh, you can see the Excel formulas that I made for calculating relative efficiency based on that. And I think they kind of easier to go through than this slide. Uh, so anyway, with the dummy data set, you actually get better relative efficiency with method three, and you don't want to just go based on that alone. You also look at the ANOVA and say, okay, well, since method one only accounts for row column effects, and the ANOVA showed that there were no significant row column effects, that means that method one probably isn't going to be effective, and sure enough, it wasn't. Um, it did. It, it actually reduced your, or it actually increased your experimental error relative to the experimental error without making any adjustment. Versus method the, method three improved it, and then it's also a good idea to look at heat maps and residual plots and other whatever else you can. And remember that. Uh, like with with anything involving blocking, um, you're really only going to be able to adjust for things that kind of occur more in gradients. And the row column effects from method one, especially, can only account for uh, for large gradients. And uh, method three can account for a lot. Uh, a very a field variation that occurs on a smaller scale than method one, uh, but it can also account for for variation that occurs on a larger scale. And to be honest, you generally end up, I'll tell you just from my experience, you generally end up using method three. And that's actually also what people saw with, uh, uh, with data sets that they, that are random, 
sets of data that they generated that you, you, you most often uh, end up using method three. But also remember that um, method one only uses the primary check to evaluate field, or sorry, to estimate field effects, and method three actually uses all of the checks. But method three does not use all of the incomplete blocks. And then also it's important to note that sometimes you can find, because the ANOVA only accounts for row column effects, sometimes you can find no significant effects in the ANOVA, like with this example, but still find that method three adjustment is useful. All right, and so in the end, uh, you're, you're going to use, I'm not going to read through all of these, but uh, in the end, you're going to use all of your knowledge about that particular trial and, uh, and how the, you know, the, the lines, the fields, how, you know, how the trial was run, how the data were collected to decide and look at heat maps and other things to decide which method you want to use. Whoa, what happened to my screen? Hmm. I don't know, you know, this, this presentation looks possibly far more exciting than ours. Maybe we should just do that one. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't know. I've seen some. I've seen some, some pretty interesting, fair presentations. So I guess I've. It is. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh yeah. And so I actually just. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to make one big point in that. Um, I'm not, uh, I'm not just, just saying that you need to consider lots of things to kind of cover my bases in case something goes awry with your analysis. <laughs> but, uh, but because it is important, uh, I can't tell you how many times where I had a, uh, um, or, oh, I can tell you at least one of them because I put it on this slide. Um, you know, sometimes you'll get you'll get relative efficiencies that seem suggestive. Like I once had a relative efficiency of 112 percent with method three, but then I had a negative regression coefficient for uh, for method three, which doesn't make sense. I mean, it doesn't make sense that as my primary checks are increasing in value, that my secondary checks would be decreasing. I mean, that's possible. But you need to kind of think about, um, you know, what kind of measurements you were taking, and is that is is that biologically realistic? And so, I mean, anytime your calculations always have to match the biology. Um, I think my uh, my sort of favorite joke about that, which a genetics professor once told me, is uh, well, it was it was about it was about uh, it was about engineers. So sorry if there's any engineers here. But uh, but the joke is, uh, you ask an engineer for a baby, and they give you uh, one month and nine women because the math works out. And just because the math works out doesn't mean it's actually physically possible. So it's really really important to consider that, and always look at residual blots. Yeah, and you definitely, you do, you definitely, um, for every data set, you may use a different method. And, you know, I mean, different, uh, you're going to have different things causing field effects in your experiment, and, uh, and it's not just, 
the variation in your field, but also how sensitive any given trait is to that specific type of variation. And so for my data sets from the same, uh, from the same experiment, like I said, I, I more often use method three, but sometimes I'll have no adjustments. Uh, and, uh, and, and sometimes I'll actually get really high relative efficiency for method one when everything else had kind of a, a moderate relative efficiency for method three. So. That is a good question, Leanne. <laughs> um, yeah, so, yeah, Celeste emailed me about that, and you guys had some really good ideas and so um, on how to handle that, and I think she's going to maybe talk about that later, so I'll give, uh, uh, I'll, I'll sort of wait until she's done with her slides to see if she if she does want to talk about it. But um, yeah, if it's not too much greater than one, um, I guess that's that's sort of that's sort of a cheat. Um, it's it's basically approximately one. So, but um, uh, but um, I first of all, just like you guys get very skeptical <laughs> if if the slope's greater than one, and I look at my lines. So some lines are going to be more sensitive to effects. Like for example, I was doing a nitrogen use efficiency trial. One of our checks, it turned out, actually our primary check, is very sensitive to uh, nitrogen levels in the soil. And so um, we actually found that for traits that kind of tend to uh, be strongly dependent on nitrogen, like grain plumpness, the, uh, if you just looked at the variance, if you just estimate variance based on individual checks, the variance for grain plumpness with the primary check was more than twice the variance for either of the other checks. And so, um, so now it was a primary check in that case, but um, if it had been one of the secondary checks and maybe one, the primary check was relatively insensitive to nitrogen, then, uh, and I knew that from previous studies, and I just had some way of really assessing that relationship, then um, then I would make the decision, or, or yeah, I might, you know, I might simply decide to, uh, to, um, to kind of knock down that slope based on some criterion that, uh, some new estimation method that I came up with. So, but, um, but yeah, and I will say there's not, um, there, you know, you just kind of follow the general rules. Like, you know, you use, you, you, you do row column effects for method one and you do a regression for method three and however, however you want to alter that, I think based on your data set is fine. And granted, I am just a first year PhD student and so I'm not necessarily <laughs> maybe uh, uh, the, the person whose advice is to be followed strictly on this. But um, but but I have been talking to a number of people with with many 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 years of experience, and they 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 have further convinced me that that's okay. Oh, and here are. Um, and here are the uh, the original papers. Uh, I'll just warn anyone who wants to read them that you kind of have to go through all four of these at the same time, to, uh, or at least the first three at the same time to kind of really figure out what's going on. And um, and also that the only difference between a type one and a type two modified mental design is that the type one in theory, has square plots. Although I don't think I've ever seen a, a truly like a perfectly square plot in my life, but um, but has about square plots. And uh, uh, and in and uh, with uh, type two, you actually have long narrow plots that are uh, that just kind of run in one direction across the 
across an inkscape block. Okay. Have I compared the relative efficiency of correcting with the weight based on slopes versus just using the straight frame of um, Okay, so do you mean, I'm guessing you mean something different than just doing, yeah, so that's, I mean, like, that's one thing, uh, that's one thing to do. Um, Yeah, but, I mean that's one approach. Um, and, I mean you might want to compare a number of different slopes. Uh, yeah, so I don't. And then I mean you also might want to at that point too. If you think things are really kind of, if you think there's really some fishy stuff going on with your checks, you might also just want to look into um, into spatial variation. I had kind of I had a augmented design when I was doing my, my master's thesis that just had serious just due to the um, due to the this uh, sort of the the spatial level of the variation in the field that my incomplete blocks and my checks weren't really accounting for uh, for field variation appropriately and I ended up having to kind of throw it out and or kind of throw out the uh, the information the the sort of sketchy information that I got from uh, from analysis with my checks and uh, and and do some alternative methods and uh, remember that you know just like any generally with any unreplicated design it's well they're all uh, if you take away the checks it's just a completely randomized design with one <laughs> Replication. So anything uh, you don't, you know, if, if you feel like your your checks are misleading you, you can just ignore them. Like like any bad advice, you can just walk away. <laughs> yeah, but but yeah, but I'll let I'll let Celeste because the most I have thought about the the slope of one slope greater than one thing. Was because uh, I didn't really encounter it too much in my analysis so far, but it was when Celeste emailed me about it the other day, and I was, and it was finals week, and I haven't, to be honest, I haven't really had a chance to think about it much. And you guys have, uh, have been thinking about it a lot, and so I, I, I want you guys to, to, actually, I want, I want to have Celeste discuss that one. Okay, all right, uh, and I'm going to hand it over to Alfonso. Hi, this is Alfonso speaking. Just to remind you that RB and I are sharing the same headset, so that's where the mic appears that I'm the only speaker. So I will, uh, my part of this presentation is about the analysis of type 2 modified augmented designs using uh, AgroBase Generation 2. AgroBase uh, Generation 2. Oops. Um, it's a software package used by many building programs to manage and analyze field data. Here at Oregon, uh, at Oregon State University, we have been using AgroBase for the past three years or so, and we are really happy with it. Some of you have AgroBase licenses, and others may have someone else in your departments with uh, an AgroBase license. But you don't need AgroBase to generate and analyze tech to modify the multi designs. We will see an example later with Celeste that uh, she will be analyzing the, her experiment using SAS and R. However, design analy and analysis with AgroBase is very straightforward. It has some limitations, but uh, you don't find those limitations if you generate and analyze your own designs. I will show you just a brief description of the analysis. I will try to go. Uh, very fast. So, first of all, I will define some concepts that AgroBase uses. A whole plot is what Arabi was calling an incomplete block and includes a number of test subplots and a primary check in the center. Here in the slide, 
uh, we have a whole plot highlighted in green. This is a Um, we have the primary check in the center of the whole plot that is highlighted in yellow and in this case we have 14 test subplots which are uh, what Arabi was calling entry plots so in these 14 subplots we will be testing 14 lines the primary check in yellow is systematically placed in each row and column and as Arabi said this is because we want to estimate row and column effects. Then we have two secondary checks that are randomly placed into a number of randomly selected whole plots. In this case, they are circled in red. We see in the slide three randomly selected whole plots. And um, uh, each of those whole plots has two secondary checks that are also randomly placed within each whole plot. So these are the whole plots with secondary checks. Oops. Um, Agrobis has some limitations though. First is that all the subplots in the same whole plot must have be planted side by side. Here you see all the plots planted side by side. This is optimum when you have long and narrow plots like head rows and things like that because the distance uh, from the subplots on the edge of the whole plot, for example, this and that, to the center, um, to the whole plot that is in the center is, is not too big. But we will see later that for square or rectangular plots, such as um, field trial plots, um, this is not always the best option. Second, when working with a group base, the primary primary check must be placed always at the center of the whole plot. We see the primary check here in yellow. Third, the number of subplots in each whole plot must be an odd number between 3 and 15. So you cannot use whole plots with 17 or 21 test plots. It has to be somewhere between 3 and 15. And four, the fourth limitation is that you can use only two secondary checks. Um, you can select um, as many whole plots with secondary checks as you want. In this case, I have selected three whole plots, but you can only use two secondary checks. We see that sometimes for some experiments, you want to use more than two secondary checks. Let's go to the next slide. So this is how Agrobase look like, and this is the uh, options that we have to give to the program. Um, we have to um, select a number of rows and columns. Looking at the previous slide, we see that we have uh, two rows, six, sorry, six rows and two columns. Uh, we need to select the number of subplots per whole plot, which is 15 in our case. And we need to select the number of whole plots with control subplots or secondary checks, which is 3 in our case. Um, as I said before, when the experiment has rectangular plots, as is the case of gil plots, a whole plot designed across ranges makes more sense. Something like, like we have here in this slide. Um, I mean, in this case, um, the subplots are always adjusted to a nearby control plot and nearby control plot. In the slide 
Can yes, people hear me okay? Whole plot here highlighted in green again. All right. Uh, that is three ranges so, deep. Oh, go ahead. Five passes wide. This is a plot with a control pl pl plot or primary check in the center in yellow and two uh, randomly allocated uh, secondary checks in uh, blue and red. So in this example, we have 180 plots. 12 of them are um, primary checks. Six of them are secondary checks. And we will be testing 162. Yeah, so I'll try to concentrate more on what comes after you actually do the adjustment, just um, because Designs, yeah, as I said, has already before designs generated in agrobase. And trust me, it's from what Araby has plot, written in those PowerPoints, it's side. really not that hard and to figure out how to do this. I thought it was really, but really we well put together to understand how to do this. Trying to read the paper was a lot more difficult. So right. we're going to look at, um, and use I guess um, basically to explain, I'm doing one of the nitrogen use efficiency trials with six row barley a design that makes more sense. and we had used a different augmented design in 2011 but it really wasn't the blocks in it weren't small enough to capture the spatial variation that we saw in the field you can so we came to this design to try something different and um, with, um, so yeah it's a you spring planted trial in Crixton and I'm doing report. association mapping with this and eventually once I can figure out how to do all these adjustments and what we should use. Plot and only two I have 253 experimental lines plus or minus for things we've lost in Excel. and then I actually have five checks so I have there the one primary uh, check and four secondary for my analysis so far uh, I've just used before importing to uh, agrobase, the two of the secondary but I think I am going to go back and include the other two column, line, line name, just to see if that changes anything. And the there's nothing too unusual. I will point out one thing when we go to my heat map. A secondary check. And so the trait we're going to look at here is grain yield. And we're looking at this in my low nitrogen treatment field. So you can kind of see in this photo that I've got two row plots and they're just laid out in one and two uh, for the two secondary checks. This and design. Zero. So this is a plot map, and so you can pick out that there are the different ranges along the side here, and then we've got rows going this way. And so you can see that there are actually 21, if you want to call them incomplete blocks or whole plots, either way. In the center here, we've got our primary check, which is tradition of variety of barley. And then in other incomplete blocks, we've got our secondary checks, and there's four of those. And again, I only used two so far. And then the filler line, don't worry about that. That was just extra space in the design. And then, of course, all the white blocks are just all of my experimental lines. So if we look at a heat map of this, we can see that some areas have higher yield for whatever reason. Most are just around a midpoint, and then some have a low yield. I'll actually tell you that these two plots side by side here were chewed on by a gopher, and that's why they look so bad. <laughs> so we ha we kind of can see how those change and whether the adjustments actually improve the numbers we get on that type of thing. So the first thing that I did was to just do a generalized linear model in SAS. And we want to see whether whether that trait needs to be adjusted. And we can also look at our row column effects. So here we're modeling with just two factors, row and column. And we can see that both of them are significant. So we think that perhaps method one could be appropriate, but we're going to take more steps. Um, so yeah, then we basically, in R, wanted to just code a way to do this because Arabi has has shared with us a um, Excel file of how you can do all these calculations. But if you have multiple trades, multiple environments, that's going to take a lot of your time. So really, I'm going to uh, give a shout out to the postdoc that has joined our lab last fall, Mosin. 
he is the one who wrote this code really and then I sort of patched it up to make it a little more useful to me. Basically we just made three input files. One is called design and that's a file that's um, basically a matrix to be used for linear algebra that um, for each line specifies the row, the column, and the whole plot or um, incomplete block number that it corresponds to. And then we have a file called raw, which is just the raw data. And then we have one called effect. And this was just our way of, um, I went ahead and calculated the means for each row and the means for each column based on our primary check and just input them as a file. I'm sure you could code that as well. And then, so you input all those and then you want to adjust your data. And we can think of method one as raw data plus a correction factor. So we get basically that our adjusted value is going to be equal to the low value and we just pull that out of our raw data file. Plus, and then we're doing a little matrix multiplication here of that design file times the effect file. And you can do that for each trait. Um, I'm sure you could write looped code so that it does that automatically. I just copy and paste in mine because I don't know how to use R that well yet. And then you just want to write an output file that's going to have a column of the raw data with a column of the adjusted data side by side. So overall pretty simple and pretty fast. And then for the method three, we, um, well, so first I just started, I went ahead and made these plots in Excel. And so my primary check is tradition and my secondary checks here, lacy and robust. So I do the regression there and then we get the slope of the line. So this is a case where the slope is um, just a little bit over one. And I had, I had various values for that slope. So I think there was one that was negative, a few that were over one, mostly a little less than one. Okay, and so then, so then we used R to, um, to do the adjustment for method three. And so again, we have an input file and this time it's just a raw data file. And so this first part of the code actually will um, fit a linear model and uh, and pull out that slope value for you. So Mohsen figured that out and that would be a faster way of doing it than trying to do each one in Excel. And so again, you're really, um, what you end up doing is just do, uh, getting an adjusted value that's calculated from the raw datum. And then here we're just really following what Araby had showed you in her I guess made up data example where you're doing the slope for that trait and you're multiplying that by the value of tradition in that same plot minus the grand mean of tradition throughout your field. And so again then we just write a line for output. So I think it's it's pretty simple really. I think the harder part is deciding what to, which one to use and when to use them and if they're actually the best idea to use or if we should modify these methods. So um, you can do the relative efficiency and as you look here, method one actually made your, was an adjustment that made it worse whereas method three improved the amount of error you had. Um, so Airbnb has put here that you want to use method three and upload to T3 and you're done. Um, and I guess we will wait. So I would turn it back over to Airbnb and if you want to lead us into discussion or I can, either way, I have some of the questions here that I Well, uh, actually, yeah, I was kind of hoping that um, that you and Leanna might uh, 
Uh, the guy might lead the uh, discussion on the slope issue because you guys have um, yeah. So a lot I've clicked back up here to this Excel um, graph, and so we can think that certain things are going to pull this line different directions. And so if Lacey and Robust are somehow m more different from tradition, which is the primary check, that pulls our slope line up and resulted in a greater slope. And so since you use that slope as a, as a multiplier here, what you're basically saying is that um, with a greater slope, there's a bigger difference between your secondary checks and your primary check. And yet, you are giving greater weight to an adjustment based on that primary check. And so we didn't think that that really makes logical sense. Uh, Liana had an idea that maybe you could do some type of absolute value where you would like take that slope that's greater than 1 and subtract it from 1. So if you have a slope of 1.4 and you subtract that from 1, you're going to get uh, negative 0 0.6 and you could take an absolute value and maybe use that as your multiplier. I haven't checked through whether that's a valid way to do this, but that's like along along the lines of what we think maybe would be a good modification when you have that problem. Um, and this also led us to wonder about those uh, secondary checks. So you really want to know that your secondary checks are somehow similar to your experimental lines because really you're ex adjusting all your experimental lines based on your primary check. So if your experimental lines are similar to your secondary checks, then using those secondary checks to regress on the primary check sort of gives you a good idea of whether whether your the way your primary check has performed is going to be similar to the way that your experimental lines performed. And so um, I think it was Kevin, my uh, advisor, who even threw out that maybe instead of a variety for those were those were a couple of things that we were kind of still wondering about. Let me see. I'll look at my email, and I think I had. Oh, yeah. So this is kind of a simpler one. Excuse me, but the other question that I had posed to Araby was, um, if you think about it, you're going to have a smaller adjustment for anything that didn't actually need to be adjusted. So I actually checked for things that had a block effect to determine whether there was some spatial variation that needed to be adjusted for. Because usually, at least in our lab, we like to leave the data alone. If it doesn't, if it doesn't need an adjustment, why play with it? But then with these methods, you're going to have a much smaller adjustment for things that don't necessarily need a big spatial variation adjustment. So it was kind of a question of, should we just go ahead and adjust everything and count on the fact that uh, traits that didn't really have a spatial variation will just get a smaller adjustment. Um, OK, so I guess just according for Catherine's question, uh, that's just kind of the the varieties that we often use in our lab for for checks. And um, I actually I have those two other checks that I haven't used for analysis so far, but they're actually near isogenic lines for protein, which should have something to do with nitrogen use efficiency. So those that kind of consideration might be. Um, something to look at as far as using lines that correspond to the biological idea that you're trying to get at. Um, and maybe, I know Araby had said something about R squared values and when you get a bad R squared value, um, lining that up with 
So like Liana is saying that for her population, the parent of her population, because she has, um, I guess it's like a back cross, a set of back cross lines that were all back crossed to this, this one parent, which is called Rasmussen. That's her primary check. So yeah, I don't have anything like that, but you would want to pick a line that's somehow similar to other lines in your association mapping panel. Um, so like I have all elite lines from various breeding programs. So we wouldn't want to like pick a wild line or something for a check course that I think is pretty much common sense. Yeah, so I guess, so, um, you know, we, Alfonso and I did discuss, uh, did, did have a lot of discussion uh, about selecting a primary check. And it, for us, it wasn't, um, it wasn't, it was, it was, I had pretty reasonable slopes, but it was based on, uh, like I said, looking at that, um, looking at the plump data from my nitrogen use efficiency trial and seeing that the primary check had had double the the variance uh, for plump, for grain plumpness that um, that the secondary checks had and so basically saying that like the primary check was just and, and we also happened to find out after that experiment had been planted that that primary check was was pretty sensitive to the soil nitrogen. And so then the idea, well, okay, so the more sensitive to field variation your primary check is, then the more it's going to be able to detect field variants. But at the same time, especially with the type one, when you're only adjusting, when you're only calculating adjustments based off of uh, the, the values of the primary check, you're really going to be you're you're going to be at serious risk then, or actually, and you're going to expect to over adjust uh, due to the higher sensitivity of the primary check. But uh, but then with the secondary checks uh, for for type uh, for method three, um, that can kind of account for the the sort of the the expected lesser sensitivity of all the other lines compared to the primary check, but then you still have that primary check, the sensitivity of the primary check picking up field variation. Now, of course, it also means that when you're estimating your, um, your experimental error based on your primary check, that you're going to be overestimating your experimental error. But then with these types of trials, you're not even so much, since you're not making, you're not really making comparisons between two lines, you, you really, you don't even really use the exper experimental error for much. It's more, you just want the um, as accurate relative differences, the, or relative uh, values of the the line means as possible. But um, yeah, so we we've kind of been uh, been been toying with different different options and different ways of selecting a primary check ourselves. And I definitely, actually, I'm, I'm almost kind of jealous of you guys with your, with your four secondary checks because we use Agribase, and Agribase can only handle two primary checks uh, um, in, the, in its analysis system. And, uh, and I really think that, I think, Honestly, just increasing the number of secondary checks helps a lot. And the other thing too, I'll say that most of the times, even when type or when method one is a better adjustment, a lot of times you method three is still quite good. You know, like sometimes you'll get a uh, a relative efficiency of like 160% with method one, and then like 144% with method three. And so then maybe in those situations. You know, if you had used a more sensitive primary check, then you might just say, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and use the method three adjustment. And mm -hmm. then you can also do, um, and especially because a lot of these times, 
for, for a lot of these experiments, either the, uh, the early generation trials or um, mapping experiments, a lot of times a lot of your lines are pretty similar in, um, you don't, I mean, depending on the mapping experiment, you know, we have the, we have like the world core barley collection and that's got a lot of variation. A lot of times with elite lines, there, there isn't a giant range of, uh, uh, of differences and you can just kind of get, a, because the main thing is that, um, right, exactly, that you want your, the sensitivity of whatever, whatever, whatever you've used, whatever lines you've used to adjust for field effects to be approximately equal to the, the sensitivity to the field effects of your experimental entries. And so, or I don't know, maybe, actually, maybe Yana just said that, but, um, but um, one thing you can always do is just, and actually the, the thing that I thought at first, the, the absolute first thing I would do, because it's easy um, and gives you a good rough idea, is uh, just regress the average of the of all the experimental entries in each in each incomplete block against the um, against the primary check. And if that's also big, um, then uh, or if that's if the slope of that is is also substantially greater than one, then you can feel, you know, I mean, you still might not want to do it, but you can feel a lot more confident. But one thing, one thing that's tricky is, yeah, exactly what you were saying, you know, I think a lot of people to get kind of carried away with, uh, with, with making adjustments and you really don't want to <laughs> adjust, uh, if, if you're, you really don't want to adjust data unless, unless it needs it. But, um, but one of the problems with these uh, you know, if you're doing kind of more of a hypothesis testing experiment and just comparing multiple treatments, you know, and you, if you don't do adjustments, then you, um, you, you know, your error, your experimental error is, is higher, but at least you kind of feel it's more it, it it just is higher, and that's more accurate, and you're less, and you're saving yourself. I think Irvi has a really good point there, and something I've talked about with Kevin is um, your adjustment's that, not going to uh, find you some like uh, experimental error and lower one power. true value for but that line or for with, any of your um, lines. So I think you can adjust, and you want to get something better than the unadjusted. With these trials, but is that it's really you're not going to read something perfect. So I think we want to use and the quality of your conclusions modifications of um, these methods where it makes sense, on, but not keep playing with it so much. And I think really the other thing I keep thinking about is I certainly want to do other things with these ranks. data. And so, so I want to find an adjustment that's good and that I think is relevant be, and doesn't have big issues with it. An over adjustment if you were doing selections, whereas but as, if you were. I was wondering too, do people um, that are less familiar with this have questions? Because I feel like some of us that are sort of less more familiar and have worked through it have been sort of and then you're asking some questions under, and discussing, but under maybe other people. And risking over adjustment. Definitely. Yeah. 
So I'm not sure what your question is. You know, I suppose there's also nothing stopping you from do from really using two varieties as sort of like a co-primary check and just do two plots of of two two adjacent plots of two different varieties uh, of the same two varieties in the center of uh, of every incomplete block and then taking the average and then just using the average of those as your uh, as your primary check um, but then you do need that many more plots or you could also just do it for you know or maybe like say maybe you have uh, 17 incomplete blocks and you have uh, sort of 15 plots of filler left well you could just do it for 15 um, of the incomplete blocks it would still be better <laughs> Sarah, are you? Oh, God. Yeah, yeah, and that's another thing. Yeah, I'm not, but I will say with, with filler too, um, and one of the things, so a lot of times people tend to pick, uh, you know, because you have your checks for field variance, and then you also have, you know, you also have your, your, your different type of check, your check lines that are your um, more like your controls. Your, you know, if you're doing a disease trial, you want your your known resistant line and your known susceptible line. And uh, a lot of times, people will pick their um, will just you know decide. Well, I'll, I'll get a two in one. You know, I'll get because you want extra replications of your standard lines. So a lot of people will use them as their checks. Um, but sometimes those are going to be more uh, expected to be more or less sensitive to field effects, far more or far less sensitive to field effects than your experimental entries, and you're probably better off just uh, just augmenting those with you know just taking your filler lines and making extra replications of your um, of the lines you're more interested in without actually making them your checks. Yes, uh, Lennon, you know, in the original Lynn Pushinsky paper we used, I mean, you you had to use super square plots and just like precisely square plots and precisely square and complete blocks. Um, I believe they actually, I could be wrong, but I think they actually found, I think they actually tested in later papers or people, it was either that or people in later papers people looked at um, uh, how their adjustments changed with their field effects and found you could use um, larger incomplete blocks. But I will say that anytime you're adjusting based on incomplete blocks, your incomplete blocks can only get so big before you're unable to actually represent your field variation. And so that's something important to consider too. Um, I mean, yeah, I would imagine for the for the regression, I mean, I would imagine you're just going to get, uh, well, I would certainly think that the increased distance would uh, decrease your R-squared and then probably, um, well, I guess it depends on the field variation. So, Alfonso, is that true in general, that if you had a low R-squared value, then you would also see a lower relative? Um, you know, I think in the, like, the sort of classic bare minimum, you just take into account relative efficiencies and, or you could just take into account relative efficiencies. 
and then possibly also the Anova. But I mean, I I always try and look at everything I can because you know, like Celeste said, one of the most important things is to make sure that you to not <laughs> to not over adjust or improperly adjust that that adjustments are adjustment should be a very conservative affair. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you could have a slope of 1 and a very low x squared. I mean, you could actually, I mean, you 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 could have like a very strong, very consistent field effect, but then just a really high um experimental error. And so then you'd get a low R square and a uh, and a slope of one. So this is Alfonso speaking, but if you have a slope of one and a very low R square, then the relative efficiency will be very low for method three. So you don't need to do uh, probably you don't need to to correct for that. I'm not sure it's, if it's true in general, but I would say that probably yes. Probably low R squares will give you really bad relative efficiency because you are just not, when you do the adjustment, you are just not uh, decreasing the variance of the checks. Probably you are just um, doing, uh, yeah, you, you can just, um, getting a completely inappropriate uh, adjustment. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, and they're, I mean, they're, they're related to, so I mean, it's the, um, the variation between, you know, the, the R squared is, is related to the very, is linked to the variation between, um, or, across the uh within the across and within the secondary checks and so is the relative efficiency so you know if the um if the regression exp explains very little of that variation then uh, you probably won't uh, decrease it too much But yeah, I've definitely seen some, and I've definitely seen just some weird stuff. Like I said, I mean, uh, a, a, like very suggestive relative efficiencies and then negative slopes for the regression. Is yeah, I could um, post them. They're not very pretty. Wrong, but <laughs> except in very special I could send them to you and you could either make them <laughs> so, prettier but even or then, just you know you don't want to dismiss it you want to just think you know does everything I have make sense but yeah like like again like Celeste is just nail on the head with be be careful about <laughs> look closely so at all, all of your all goes to most be, very, so. be very conservative with the um, I'm actually going to have to go too but <laughs> I but can send stuff to on, people, and people can send me questions or... Be very careful. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're 30 minutes over time. <laughs> oh. So I think I think there is a lot of a lot of uh, just really really commendable dedication for everyone who stayed this late. <laughs> Thank you.
Uh, yeah. I mean, we could also do just like for heritability, we could probably just do like a pre-recorded deal and put that up. Um, and then uh, I could just put the slides up too. Just like the just like originally with the the type two modifier meant to design, and then because I feel like I feel like there's probably going to be there's sort of more variations on how you can calculate heritability and um uh and I even kind of point that out in my slides and just like well you could choose all of these various options and anything you could think out as long or think of as long as it fits the basic principles and so um. Maybe we should probably give potentially give other people a chance to uh, come up with those. And yeah, uh, Celeste has all the uh, the R code and, and and demo files are are Celeste, except for the dummy data set, which I made. Which, like I said, is a subset of actual data. Uh, but, but Celeste data is real, 100% raw. Data. And there's like, like the annotation was really.